got scratched. Okay. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, Peter said uh, that they twist. The unlearned and the unstable twist, or they contort Scripture. And so the Apostle Paul said, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? And so Jesus and the apostles utilized pictorial, parabolic language in, in much of their teaching. And thus, in my ever-expanding, ever or never-ending search of ways to present the gospel in a more simple manner, I present to you a red crayon. So you ask, how do you know that's a crayon? Well, because the label says so. Well, how do you know it's a red crayon? Well, because the label says red. It doesn't say Indian red. It doesn't say fuchsia. It doesn't say pink. The label says red. Now, is that my interpretation? No, it's not. Why? Because the label says it is a red crayon. Is that my opinion? No, it's not. Am I making an assumption? No. Why? Because the label says it is a red crayon. Simple. Right? Okay. Here we have the only prophecy of the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with the angels for the opening of the book's judgment at the time of the establishment of the everlasting kingdom. Simple, right? It's not my interpretation. It's not my, not an assumption. It's not my opinion. That's what the label says. Here, in Daniel 12, we have the only prophecy of a resurrection of both. And it's lagging. There we go. Of both the just and the unjust, synchronous with the opening of the book of judgment at the time of the end, not the end of time inextricably linked to the time of trouble in the time frame of the abomination of desolation. Once again, this is as simple as a red crayon. This is what the label says. Now, we have these two prophecies that are inextricably linked by the opening of the book's judgment. Had a fellow objected to that statement, he said Daniel 12 is not the same judgment as Daniel 7 because it says everyone that shall be found written in the book. Because it says book singular and Daniel 7 says books plural, it can't be the same judgment. Well, let's read Revelation 20 and verse 11. I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. That's Matthew 16, 27. And so this is what we find happens to these ridiculous objections. Now, I was in a Bible study one morning. It was my turn to speak that morning. It was preceded by Bible study. And this was shortly after I had come to the position of realized eschatology. And three, at least, of the brethren there, they knew that. And they began commenting on eschatology, the resurrection. And they were trying to draw me into a crossfire in the public assembly when I had expressly told them I don't want to do this in the public assembly. I want the brother to sit down privately and study. They were trying to draw me into this crossfire situation and I wouldn't do it. But they came to Daniel 12 and because Daniel 12 says many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth, then they were trying to make the argument that that can't be this so-called final judgment at the end of time when all of the dead would be raised and judged. And so they decided that it was the many bodies of the saints that slept, arose after the resurrection, 
that we read about in Matthew 27. And, you know, I had one of the Popeye moments. I've had all I can stand. I can't stand the Lord. And so I quoted Brethren. That can't be right because Paul quoted the resurrection of the just and the unjust in Acts 24.15. And he said that that was still in his future. Amen. That's right. That was the last time that I ever was allowed to speak in that congregation. I wonder why. Yeah, I got the phone call. We can't let you speak on the resurrection. But we have these two prophecies, and I've shown you the simplicity of these two prophecies and these texts. Please go and read all of the texts. And here's the beauty. I don't have to interpret anything of Daniel 7 or Daniel 12. Now we can. It's fun. It's interesting. It's a good study. But I don't have to. Why? Because Jesus quotes Daniel 7 in Matthew 24, 30 and 31. And then He says, Verily I say unto you, this generation, there's that time indicator, this generation will not pass till all of these things be fulfilled. But which generation is He talking about? Well, it would be the generation that would see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. And it would be the generation that when they would see that abomination, those in Judea would flee to the mountains. And it would be the generation that would experience the great tribulation. And it would be the generation who immediately, there's another time indicator, immediately after that tribulation, they would see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. All the tribes of the earth would see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, power and great glory, and He'll send His angels to gather the elect. Again, this is as simple as a red crate. Because that's what the label says. I don't have to interpret anything. And I have presented this argument, this specific argument, from April the 2nd of this year, and I've not had I've, I've shared it scores of times and in many different venues, and I've not had one futurist touch the heart of the argument. That is Jesus' quotation, interpretation, and application of these two prophetic texts. But then we are forced to contend with the with the errorists who have spent years, yea, even decades, honing their skills at obfuscation and deflection. And they play their game of twisting, contorting Scripture. And they take the beauty, the simplicity of Jesus' interpretation, and they begin to blow smoke and obfuscate inject their own qualifiers into the text, redefine the terminology, etc., 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 until they fabricate something totally foreign to the Bible, something non-existent. Like this generation means that generation. Or this generation means the human race. But the context, the label... The context reveals that the generation to whom Jesus is referring would be the generation that would see false Christ performing great signs and wonders. They would see the gospel priest in all the world. They would see the abomination of desolation, Jerusalem surrounded by armies. They would experience the great tribulation. They would see Jerusalem trodden underfoot by the Gentiles for 42 months. They would see the Jewish temple completely dismantled. It would be the generation that would see the apostles killed. It would be the generation that would see the day of redemption. And it would be the generation that would see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Now, was that Pentecost? No. I challenge any man anywhere to show me the Scripture that says the kingdom would or did come on Pentecost. Futurists, there's your challenge. Now, look here. We're familiar with this. But let's look at this. Jesus cites Daniel 7 in Matthew 16, 27 to 28. The Son of Man is about to come, mellow in the present tense, with His angels, glory of the Father. He will give reward to each according to their practice. Now we're familiar with the parallels, Mark 8 and Luke 9. Here's what I want you to notice. The phrases in the brown, see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom, is synonymous with seeing the kingdom of God come with power, is synonymous with see the kingdom of God. Those phrases are synonymous because this is the same conversation recorded by three writers. 
And any argument that separates these two verses divorces the Son of Man from coming in His kingdom. Because the Son of Man coming in His kingdom is synonymous with the Son of Man coming in His glory. And I'm going to prove that. That's right. Now, futurists, you come up here close now. Turn your hearing aids up so you can see and hear what I'm about to show you. You remember the incident when James, John, and their mommy came to Jesus asking Him for a favor? She said, Grant that these my two sons may sit the one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. But Mark records the same statement as sit on your right hand and on your left in your glory. You see that? You see that, futures? The Son of Man in His kingdom is synonymous with the Son of Man coming in His glory. The Olivet Discourse is Jesus foretelling the coming of the Son of Man in His kingdom. And we lose sight of that. And futurists, it completely goes over their head because they are so focused on the destruction of Jerusalem. In fact, that's their very argument for when Jesus said all things written will be fulfilled in about the fall of Jerusalem. They separate that and they insert their qualifier about the destruction of Jerusalem. And they completely miss the fact that Jesus is foretelling the Son of Man coming in His kingdom because He's quoting from the only prophecy, the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, etc., ushering in the everlasting kingdom. And again, Jesus quotes that in Matthew 24, 30 and 31. The Son of Man, all tribes of the earth will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He'll send His angels with the great sound of a trumpet. Did you see that? Let's back up and look at that again. He shall send His angels with the great sound of a trumpet. They'll gather together His... Now look what He says next. He gives them the parable of the fig tree. And then He says, So likewise you, when you see all these things, know that it is near. What is it? It is a pronoun. It has to refer to an antecedent. What is it? We'll look at Luke's record. you got the Son of Man coming in the cloud. He gives them the parable of the fig tree. Now look what He says. So likewise you, when you see these things come to pass, know you that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. You see, these are a carbon copy of each other. And it is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. But then again, the Scripture twisters come blowing into town, kicking dust, <laughs> kicking dust and, and, and uh, calling names. It has to be a transition verse at verse 36 because... Prior to that, he's talking about those days, and then he switches by saying that day. So we have this transition verse theology. But look what Jesus said before verse 36, For as the lightning comes out of the east, shines to the west, notice, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. But he said the exact same thing in Luke 17 in specific answer to when the kingdom of God would come. That's right. You see that? Now notice what he says in Luke. For as the lightning that lightened out of one part of the heaven shines to the other part of the heaven, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be in His day. You see that? There's that day. That's right. First, He must suffer many things, be rejected of who? This generation. That's the same thing He says in the context of Matthew 16. Right. I'll build my church. The gates of Hades not prevail against it. I'll give you the keys of what? The kingdom. First, I must suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. Same thing. Same topic. But then after verse 36, he gives the analogy of Noah. Notice, please, the phrases in green. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. They are identical. They're not similar. Similarity of language means that, I, and I'm impersonating John Watson, impersonating John Welch. <laughs> These are exactly the same. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Verse 37, verse 39, verse 27. The exact same statement. But wait a minute. Jesus used the exact same analogy, said the same thing in Luke 17 in specific response to when the kingdom would come and said, Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Wait a minute. 
in verses uh, 37 and 39, he's talking about the parousia of the Son of Man. Wait a minute. That's what he's talking about in verse 27. Again, these statements are exactly the same. And that is in specific answer to the question, what will the sign of your parousia be and at the end of the age? So you see, Jesus is explaining His parousia at the day of God, which would be when the Son of Man would be revealed. You see that? And so all throughout the Olivet Discourse, Jesus is talking about the parousia. There's not two subjects here. Wait a minute. Let's go on. Jesus gives the analogy of the two in the field and the two grinding at the meal. One taken, the other left. But He uses the exact same analogies in Luke 17 and their specific answer to when the kingdom of God should come. And then He says in Matthew, Watch ye therefore... For you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Same thing he says in verse 36. You see that? You see how simple that is? Then, when we look at the phrase, but of that day, well, the word that is translated that is, and you can see the Greek word there, and this is a demonstrative pronoun. What does that mean? Well, that is the part of speech that substitutes for nouns or noun phrases and designates persons or things asked for previously specified or understood from the context. So when futurists admit that verses 3 through 35 apply to the destruction of Jerusalem, they are in a fatal self contradiction. Why? Because there is no end of time or end of material creation previously specified in a context they admit applies to the destruction of Jerusalem. That is red crown simple. But do they have an out? Does the crawl go backwards? So they back up and they rip the phrase heaven and earth shall pass away out of the context of the Son of Man coming in His kingdom at the end of the Mosaic age and say that's the that day, but alas, they are still in another huge self-contradiction. Why? Because they argue that the law ended at the cross. And Jesus said, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law. You see that? Now, I don't care how much effort is put into dichotomizing and chopping up and separating and divorcing the prophecies, the prophets from the law, from the Psalms. Jesus said, the law. Until heaven and earth pass, the law will not pass. So if whatever Jesus is referring to by the phrase heavens and earth has not passed, time indicator, then the law of Moses remains fully binding and enforced. Every jot and every tittle. That's right. And so under simple exegesis, this transfer, transition verse theology is thoroughly falsified. Now pardon me while I make a slight transition here. <laughs> Pun intended. Because open office could not support the whole program in one in one program. Yay. Alright, so we're looking at the word parousia. This word is defined as presence, a coming, arrival, advent, but notice that it is a singular noun. So when we talk about the parousia, of Christ, the parousia of the Son of Man, there's only one. That's right. Which is quoting from Daniel 7, which is the only one prophecy of the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. Alright, this word is found 24 times in the New Testament. You can see the color blue there. Two-thirds, of, a little over two-thirds 
of those instances, it is referring specifically to the parousia of the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, coming in His not with observation kingdom in the last days, day of the Lord. Oh, goodness, but our detractors. They point to one of the other instances where it refers to a, an actual person coming from point A to point B, and they say, well, don't you know, aren't you aware that the parousia has several ways which is used in Scripture and you can't apply the same meaning everywhere? And you see, the reason they do that is for distraction. is So that they can apply the same meaning everywhere. They apply the physical application of the term all across the times it's talking about the Lord coming. <laughs> Definitely a little bit of humor on too. <laughs> okay, so the context of Matthew 24 is the Pharisee of the Son of Man at the end of the age. But that's the context of 1 Corinthians 15. Because Paul is talking about the Pharisee of the Son of Man at the end. And he posits that in their lifetime. The context of Paul's epistles is saturated with the parousia of the Son of Man and the clouds of heaven, which he posits in their lifetime. James wrote that the parousia of the Lord is at hand. Oh, but again, we have to deal with our distract distractors and here is what Terry Benton said to try to mitigate the specificity of parousia. When things equal to the same thing are equal to each other, as Roy says, then parousia and elusitia are equal to each other and it doesn't matter which word is used. He just stuck his foot in his mouth royal. Watch. The verb elustia and the noun parousia are synonymous words that can refer to any coming. Well, no, a verb and a noun can't be a synonym, but we'll go on. <clears throat> Jesus came personally, once in the flesh, and will come personally again at the end when mortality is brought to an end. There is nothing that makes parousia a different kind of coming than the other times He came as Lord of hosts. Do you see what He just did? He just gave up his position on the return of the Lord based on Acts 111. Because he argues that Parousia and Lucia are synonymous. All oh, but it gets better for us. His coming, Parousia James 5 8, was at hand. AD 70 is not the first time he came as the Lord of hosts. He came as Lord of hosts upon Egypt. <laughs> But the Lord of hosts didn't come out of the cloud personally, visibly, did He? That's right. No. He came via Sargon and his army. And thus, this is the confusion that the contortionists twist themselves into. But this is their typical reply. And literally, these facts and Scripture roll off of them like water off a duck's back. Here's the fact. The fact is, because parousia is singular, there is only one parousia of the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with His angels for the opening of the book's just, the eschaton. Oh, well, I forget which one mentioned eschaton. Scott. There's only one. And these guys, again, they have spent years, they have spent decades honing their skills and applying their trade to try to make that fact disappear right before your very eyes. Now, again, Peter brings the context of the parousia into his writings. And he refers to the transfiguration as the power and coming, they were eyewitnesses of that, but that was a vision. Jesus said that was a vision. So they were permitted through a vision to see the parousia of the Son of Man. Yes. If it's a vision, 
then it's not something that's often really visible, is it? True. Correct. And Peter was in both audiences when Jesus made this statement, these two statements right here. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man, the parousia of the Son of Man be in His day. Guess what Peter was looking for? He was anticipating the parousia of the day of God. Peter was writing to the pilgrims of the dispersion, just like James was writing to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Peter was writing to the chosen generation, the strangers and pilgrims scattered among the Gentiles, and he quoted from Hosea, and he told his audience that they were what Hosea foretold. And he applied the prophecy written to Israel to them. Now what is the context of 2 Peter chapters 2 and 3? And I'm going to prove that in my future. Again, come up here real close pay attention. I'm going to prove that. And I know you, you noticed the first thing right off the bat. That is not Peter. That's Jude. So we're going to use an overlay and I'm going to prove to you the context of 2 Peter chapters 2 and 3 because of what Jude says. Because Jude interprets his right. The angels have kept not their first estate but left their own habitation yet reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. Peter says, For God spared not the angels of sin but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of judgment or into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And then he uses the analogy of Noah. Jude says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Peter uses the same example, Sodom and Gomorrah. He includes Lot, who is vexed with the filthy lifestyle of the wicked, and he points out how that God knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations, to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment, the same day of judgment, chapter 3, to be punished. Jude says, Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise the meaning, and speak evil of dignities. Who are the these? Those are the certain men crept in unawares that John quoted last night from Galatians 2. Brought in privately to spy out our liberty. Peter says, But chiefly them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed, not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Who are the them? Those are the false teachers who privately shall come in. They'll bring damnable heresies with feigned words. They make merchandise of you. That is exactly that is exactly what our brethren are doing all across this country as they threaten their members with disfellowshipment if they come to our seminars. Amen. Amen. They are terrorists. That is a terrorist activity to manipulate people through through fear and intimidation to keep them mired in the abyss of ignorance. And they're protecting their salary base. That's what they're doing. Amen. That's right. Whose judgment out of a long time lingers not and the damnation slumbereth not. Alright. Jude goes on. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally is brute beasts. In those things they corrupt themselves. Peter says the same thing in verse 12. Jude says, These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about with winds, trees whose fruit withers without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Peter says the same thing in verse 13. Jude says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the air, bailing for reward. Peter says the same thing in verse 15. Jude goes on, Raging waves of the sea, foaming at their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of His saints to execute judgment upon all the ungodly that John quoted from Enoch. And I know this portion of Enoch is inspired. That's right. This portion is inspired. And that's Daniel 7. Yeah, now, I guess you have noticed I skipped a verse. There's a method to my madness. Watch this. Whereas angels which are greater in power might bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord, which Jude explains 
Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Did you hear that? He disputed about the body of Moses. Dared not bring a railing accusation against him and said, Lord, rebuke him. Right smack dab in the middle of the context of 2 Peter chapter 2 is the body of Moses. Jude goes on. He says, But beloved, remember ye the words which are spoken before by, uh, of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch how they told you. See, that shows me that Jude's written after Peter. There should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. Jude quoted Peter verbatim, not similar, verbatim. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. We'll look at the original Greek. It is identical. And say, where is the promise of his what? His parousia. Here is the parousia of the Son of Man, the parousia of the day of God, the judgment of the body of Moses, right slap dab in the middle of 2 Peter chapter 2 and 3. And I pointed that out to Terry Benton in our written debate. Uh, well, again, that's how simple this is. But I pointed this out to Terry Benton in our written debate. And here was his response. Pay close attention. Roy referenced Jude and Peter talking about Michael disputing over the body of Moses, a thing nowhere found in the law of Moses. Roy goes outside the Old Testament to frame an argument that Jude and Peter were only talking about Judaism, which Roy called the body of Moses. There is no reference to the body of Moses as Judaism in the entire Bible. There is no reference to this particular dispute in the entire Bible. So his basic overall response was, nah, -uh, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> In my next speech, I pointed out Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 and following. And you can guess his response. Now here we have not just another pretty face. Here we have a spectacular example of when the truth falls out of the lips of the futurist and they don't even know what to see. Revelation 21 is parallel time-wise to 2 Peter 3. Well, look what we've just learned. He's just destroyed his entire paradigm. That's right. And Peter uses the analogies of the fallen angels, Noah, Sodom, and Gomorrah, which Jesus taught him regarding the coming of the kingdom. 2 Peter 2. Jude's epistle parallels 2 Peter chapters 2 and 3 as he applies the same analogies to the impending judgment of the body of Moses. And Peter was reminding his audience that the holy prophets foretold of the creation of the new heavens and the new earth at the parousia of the day of the Lord, day of the Lord coming in flaming fire. And he takes that directly out of Isaiah chapter 65 and 66. But here's the problem for the futures. That is in the time frame of God slaying Judah and His servants being called by another name. That is the inclusion of the Gentiles. And just as a side note, in this discussion, Howard Denham admitted that Isaiah 65 verses 20 through 25 applies to the Christian age. Boom! He just gave up his paradigm again. Right. Complete. I said it's preceded by the resurrection. What you apply to the Christian age is the result of the resurrection and the new heavens and the new earth. Started calling me names, booting me out of the, the uh, group that they, they had me to get into so they could tear me up. Booted me out of the group and he blocked me on Facebook. But if you're smart and really, really educated, <laughs> when, you get back, when you get backed into a corner, you can just say, well, the Bible's wrong. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Now, Isaiah chapter 66 expands upon the Lord God slaying Judah and the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. You see the new heavens and the new earth in verse 22, but we're going to back up and look at some of the context. Verse 6, a voice of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, a voice of the Lord that rendereth recompense to his enemies. 
Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Please observe that her children is the man-child. Verses 9 through 13 is an analogy, a depiction of a mother nursing her child. Again, with the inclusion of the Gentiles. And when you see this, your heart shall rejoice, your bones shall flourish like an herb, and the hand of the Lord shall be known toward His servants, and His indignation toward His enemies rendereth recompense to His enemies. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with His chariots like whirlwind to render anger with fury and His rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by sword will the Lord plead with all flesh and the slain of the Lord will be many. For I know their works and their thoughts and it shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues and they shall come and see My glory. That is Matthew 16. That is the Olivet Discourse. And I will set a sign among them, and I will send those that escape. Did you catch that? Futurists, hello? Anybody home? I will send those that escape the day of the Lord coming in flaming fire. Excellent. And I will send them, and they will declare my glory to the Gentiles. You see that? Now watch this. Revelation 12, there you go. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with sun and moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. But now we just got to back up. you got to get the context that this is during the seventh trump. The last trump, Revelation 15. The seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever. That is the fulfillment of Daniel 2, Daniel 7, the Olivet Discourse, Etc. The nations were angry at thy wrath he is come, John the Baptist said, that it's about to come, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath about to come, Matthew 3, time indicator. The nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants. There's Matthew 16. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew away, drew, drew a third part of the stars of heaven, cast into the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was through all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up Futurist, did you catch that? The woman that brought forth the man-child, the man-child was caught up unto God and to His throne. What was it Paul said? In 1 Thessalonians 4. A lag down here. First we divided into three. This we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain until the parousia shall be caught up together with them in the cloud. You see that? Now watch. The woman that brought forth the man child fled into the wilderness. For she had a place prepared to God that they would feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. What is it we find in the Olivet Discourse? Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, let those in Judea flee to the mountains. And again, when we back up to Revelation 11. Boy, this lag time messes with me. I don't know what I've pressed to go on with. <clears throat> Revelation 
Revelation 11, 1. There was given to me a reed like a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and then to worship therein. But the court that is without the temple, leave out, measure it not, for it is given to the Gentiles and the holy city, where our Lord was crucified, shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Thousand two hundred and three score days. So when we come back to our statement admitted by our uh, not, a, not just another pretty face here. Then we look at Revelation 21. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth passed away. There was no more sea. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride. Would you believe there are people, I had one last week, called me Satan. Yes. And in that discussion, there was a fellow that would not answer the question, what is the bride of Christ? I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He'll dwell with them. They shall be His people. God Himself shall be with them and be their God. <laughs> Taken from Ezekiel 37, 27. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There'll be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. Neither shall be no more pain. Why? For the former things are passed away. Again, that's Isaiah 65, 17. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Wait a minute, Runyon. I thought the title of your presentation was nothing new under the sun. Well, that's right. There's nothing new in the new that was not foretold in the old. Amen. Right. Right. And everything in the old is foretold in the new. And if it was not foretold in the old, it's not in the new. That's right. Hence, since we're still here, and since we're not under the law of Moses, then the end of time is not foretold in the old. Again, that's as simple as a red crate. But again, our errorists, distractors, have spent decades honing their skills at how to dismantle what the Bible says and how to obfuscate, cloud and confuse, which is the exact opposite of what Paul said to let all things be done unto edification. They let all things be done to obfuscation. And they dismantle what the Scriptures say that's as simple as a red crayon and they reassemble it into something totally different. <laughs> and again, I use a little humor here and not necessarily any one person particularly, but I am using these faces to represent a group or genre of people. And this particular genre of people know exactly what they're doing. That's why they have to threaten their members to not attend our seminar or our lectures because they might learn something. And they, don't, they know exactly what this is the fear that is instilled by these men. And then there's another genre of people. Well, again, this, this, uh, this is the same genre of people here. Again, they know exactly what they're doing. And this is the other genre. <laughs> they literally don't know up from down. They can't count to one when it comes to eschatology. Yeah, amen. And this is what we're dealing with. These are this. Uh, <laughs> this is the boy that called me Satan. Kenneth Langhorst. But again, he's a little humor, and it's you know it, it's not really the aspect of being called names. It is the arrogance from which it emanates. That's right. That is what is so sickening. And the fact that we know they don't know anything when it comes to eschatology. But this is the problem. And this is, this is the problem that we face and we have to combat. And you see, we don't have to call people names because we've got the truth. 
And the reason we are called names is because we have the truth. And because they can't answer our questions. And that is why they hide in the shadows, most of them. And they attack us from private. And they won't come out into the public and debate us publicly before an audience. Because they know they can't answer their, our, our arguments. And if that is exposed to a public audience, there'd be somebody there that would see that. They would realize we got the truth. Okay, I thank you so much for your kind attention. I hope you, you give this great attention to the other speakers. And I thank the church here uh, for the invitation, the opportunity to speak, and for the spectacular hospitality shown to us by Brother Steve, Sister Ronald. Amen.